What is up, Bitcoiners? It's CK, and this is another episode of the Bitcoin Magazine podcast. This was a really, really awesome show that I did with John Newberry, longtime Bitcoin Core contributor, mentor, and now the founder of Brink.dev, a Bitcoin Core focused uh, nonprofit institution that is here to train Bitcoiners and help guide funds to the best place that they can be in the Bitcoin ecosystem. John and I had a really wide ranging conversation into the history of Brink, how he thought of the idea, Bitcoin development in the bull and bear market, how Bitcoin makes sure that the right things are getting built on and how Brink is helping that happen. You guys, this was a really, really great show. I really appreciate John's time doing this show. Before we get into the interview, I want to tell you about Level. Level is a new kind of Bitcoin bank. It is not an exchange that's modeled after a brokerage service. Rather, it is a company, a fintech company that is here with the mentality that Bitcoin is money and they want to help you bank with Bitcoin. They have a FDIC checkings account where you can just plug in your USD and immediately convert convert it over to Bitcoin with zero spread and zero fees. There are never any fees on LVL.co and they have a ton of amazing features. Like I said, they are trying to help you bank on Bitcoin. So rather than being an exchange that makes money on the spread, they want to make money by helping you use Bitcoin as your everyday money, as money for your life and enable you to again get paid in fiat turn it into bitcoin spend that you know spend what you need with a debit card hodl the rest as btc again banking with bitcoin with lvl.co use btc media when you go there so that way they know we sent you there that is enough from me guys let's get into this fantastic interview with john newberry john newberry welcome to bitcoin magazine podcast hey thank you Good to be here. So, John, um, first and foremost, congratulations on launching Brink and kind of getting things started on that front. Um, you've had a lot of great interviews with uh, the likes of Nick Carter and Peter McCormick, kind of talking a lot about Brink. But um, I, I know that you, you kind of co-launched Brink with Mike Schmidt, who's uh, someone else who's been contributing to Bitcoin for a while. I'm curious, like, you know, What's the background story on like how the idea behind Brink got started? Um, you know, maybe how you got started with Mike in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I met Mike about two years ago. He contacted Steve Lee, who I started Optech with, and said, "Hey, I want to help. What can I do?" And we found things for him to do, and he continued helping Optech. And he's been very reliable and. A, a, a great asset for Optech over the last two years. Um, I've always enjoyed working with him. I trust him. I, I value his judgment. And so when I started thinking about putting together a team for Brink, his name was pretty obvious and pretty high up on the list. And it was really exactly what he wanted to do. He's you know, He wants to contribute to Bitcoin. He was previously working at Blockstream and wanted to move more into open source contributions. Um, so he left Blockstream, I think, a year or so ago and has been working on Optech. Um, and then I started Brink and, and he, he, he helped me with that. And he's um, now on the board and also in the executive team. So very happy to have him with me. Um, Brink started, well, started thinking about Brink earlier this year. I'd been working at Chaincode for the last four years, contributing to Bitcoin Core and doing various other things in the Bitcoin space. And I felt like it was time for me to come back to the UK um, I, I left England in 2010, and so I've been away for 10 years, and it felt like a good time to to move back and be closer to family. And Chaincode is fully in the office in New York, so currently they don't have any remote employees. Well, currently, currently they do because everyone's remote, but as soon as COVID's over, everyone will be back in the office, and I won't be going back to New York, so I need to find something else to do and, and find some other way to contribute to Bitcoin. Um, and I've always had a strong... Um, mentoring part of my work. I, I find that very important and, and rewarding for myself, actually. And so I wanted to do something where I could continue contributing to Bitcoin um, and also mentoring new contributors. And at the same time, I was talking to 
John Pfeffer and Vences Casares, who have been very generous with their support of both Optech and other Bitcoin open source endeavors. They, they support other developers. Um, and the idea around a 501c3 so that um, big hodlers could, could contribute to Bitcoin development came about. Adam Jonas at Chaincode helped a lot with the initial research there. Um, so I owe a debt of gratitude to him for doing some of the groundwork. Um, and so Brink was kind of putting all of those things together, a way for developers to be funded, a way for Bitcoin hodlers to contribute to that effort, and a way to mentor and onboard new developers. And, and Brink is kind of the amalgamation of those ideas. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you for that background. And I guess kind of diving into, um, you know, the the tax uh revolution that um brink is hoping to bring to you know bitcoin contribution um i guess what is the current status and i'm assuming that you that brink is kind of trailblazing a little bit in terms of uh you know establishing an organization to fund you know bitcoin development as uh, as a true nonprofit in the us i'm sure that's something that um, you know, takes a little bit of uh, maneuvering. So I guess, you know, what's the current status there? And, and you know, what have you learned throughout the process? Right, well, there is some history. There was the Bitcoin Foundation. Um, and obviously, when I, when I mentioned the words Bitcoin Foundation, I need to highlight that we are different from the Bitcoin Foundation. There's a lot of bad history there. Um, the Bitcoin Foundation was a 501c six, I believe. It wasn't a 501c3. It was a, I think, a trade organization or association officially. Um, so it didn't have the same tax exempt status as a 501c3. It had various problems with governance. Um, the, the board, I think there was a conflict of what it should become. And it had a very wide mission in terms of development advocacy, policy, standards, local affiliates, all kinds of things, far too wide and unfocused, I think. And I think that's what caused its eventual demise. Um, so that was around 2012, I think. It lingers on in some kind of zombie state, um, but it's not really active in terms of open source contributions to Bitcoin. Um, there are other 501c3s as the HRF, the Human Rights Foundation, has a Bitcoin development fund where people can um, donate to Bitcoin development. HRF isn't focused entirely on Bitcoin. It has a much wider mission than Bitcoin. It's nice that it has this part, um, but it's, it's a much wider organization. And then the MIT DCI, um, the Digital Currency Initiative, also takes donations, um, I think generally larger donations and funds some Bitcoin protocol work. But again, it's it's a larger organization, obviously MIT. The DCI doesn't focus entirely on Bitcoin. It, it focus on, focuses on digital currencies in general. Um, so Brink really is different because it is focused solely on Bitcoin, Bitcoin protocol development. I believe there are there's another project called OpenSats. I don't know a lot about it, but they are trying to become a 501c3 to support Bitcoin development. And that's very healthy, but our competition's good. And uh, we're all on the same team. We're all you know, trying to help Bitcoin. So if other organizations come along following Brink, then that's all for the good. I think it's, it's, it's good for Bitcoin and that's what we're all here for. It's really amazing to see how Bitcoin really aligns incentives uh, in terms of you know the ecosystem in general. It's hard even to look like for Bitcoin Magazine, there are other folks you know vying for eyeballs as well. Um, but at most they're frenemies, right? Like they're, they're still on team Bitcoin in the end. Yeah, I hope so. And, um, you know, we, we all hope this thing will succeed, right? And um, a rising tide lifts all boats. So, you know, as, as long as things are expanding, then there's room for everyone. And we all hope things will expand and continue to expand. Can you comment a little bit on like the the current status in the process and like when do you do you have like a forecast for when you think uh, the regulatory hurdles will be uh, will be cleared? So to become a five hundred one c three in the United States, um, you first incorporate your organization, which we have done. Uh, we are a nonprofit corporation in, incorporated in Delaware. 
And once you've done that, you then file with the IRS a form called the 1023 form to apply for 501c3 status. We sent that paperwork in probably four months ago. It goes into a big machine called the IRS. And at some point later, some answer comes out and either we have 501c3 status or we don't and we appeal and we try to get it. Um, that can take two months, it can take eight months, it can take a year. We have no visibility into that process. It's just in a, in a black box called the IRS. We, we're pretty confident that we'll get it. We, you know, obviously we hope we'll get it. We, we wouldn't be doing this if we thought we wouldn't. We modeled the 1023 application pretty closely on um, the Zcash Foundation application. Uh, the Zcash Foundation exists to support development in Zcash. So um, similar kind of mission focused on Zcash instead of Bitcoin. And they were successful in getting their, 10, their 501c3 status in 2017. So you know, we, we hope that we'll get the same answer as them. Wow, that's, I mean, I could think of many reasons why Zcash Foundation may have some strange conflicts of interest. So um, we don't have to comment on that, but uh, I wish you the best of luck. And uh, I'm sorry that you kind of have to deal with this, but I commend you for, you know, moving forward because uh, I do think that, at, you know, at least there is a mental barrier maybe of donating. Um, and now at least for the, for the US, like that tax exemption, I think it is a, a big deal. Um, so um, I'm excited to uh, to see your future success at some point. Um, I do want to kind of change the subject to, um, you know, we are moving into what seems to be a Bitcoin bull market. You know, today, Bitcoin passed 20K finally. And, it, you know, not to talk about price too much, but it seems to be moving quickly. There's a lot of excitement around Bitcoin. Uh, and if we do enter a full-blown bull market, there's going to be craziness. Can you kind of talk about, like, on the inside, you know, Bitcoin core development, you know, compare and contrast developing in a bull market versus comparing developing in a bear market. It's the same, you know, the data structures are the same, the protocol is the same, the bugs are the same, you, you know, the work is essentially the same. Um, it is it is fun, isn't it, to see the, the number go up and it can be distracting. Um, you know, the last time this happened was end of 2017, things went a bit crazy. And then we had a bear market for you know, the best part of what two years before things started picking up again, um, and that was you know that's fine for developers because we get to focus you know heads down on the work and don't have the distraction of the the craziness. But you know the number needs to keep going up because we need to get a salary. You know we, people pe if people st stop believing in Bitcoin and, and and it doesn't succeed, and then there's there's no work for any of us to do. So um, I, w I hope that the number go going up would mean that we have a healthy Bitcoin economy and a valuable network, and it provides utility to lots of people, and we can continue working on this project that we all believe in. Yep, absolutely. Um, I mean, in terms of like, you know, folks getting excited, you know, maybe organizations are making more money. We've seen a lot of exchanges kind of start jumping into the open source development um, contribution space um, this past year. Um, can you talk about like how, how that has evolved over time? Yeah, I think um, the funding environment now is the healthiest it's ever been in Bitcoin in terms of the Kind of raw number, the the amount of money coming in and the distribution of that, or the the, the decentralization of that. Um, so currently, there are quite a few different models for funding. There's Chain Code, which employs directly employs developers and researchers, and that's a private organization funded by Alex Morkos and Suhas Daftur, and they do great work. Um, MIT DCI is Another organization that funds developers, obviously an academic organization, Blockstream, um, a private company, Square Crypto, a public company, uh, DG Labs is a company based in Japan. And then you, you have quite a few exchanges now offering grants to developers. Um, Coinbase will be announcing their grants. They, they announced an application process a few months ago, and I think they'll be announcing the winners of that process very shortly. 
OKCoin has sponsored several developers. Bitmex has sponsored several developers. Um, Kraken is sponsoring us and sponsoring other developers. Gemini have said they will sponsor us and sponsor other, other developers. So it's, it's, it's really healthy, you know, com compared to say two years ago when most of these organizations weren't funding and that there were quite, quite limited sources of funding for developers. Having that amount and having that distribution is, is really good. And we just, we just hope it will continue in that direction. Oh man, I'm I'm struggling with the the mute <laughs> and the and the stop video button. Um, do you see any issues like, or I guess not issues, but do you see any stark differences between um, kind of the attitudes coming from uh, the different players? Maybe is it you know, and if there is, is it regional, regionally based? Like, is there any sort of anything that you can kind of tell from the funding environment as it's developed? And you know what. What do these organizations are? What are they thinking? Kind of going into, hey, I'm gonna help develop uh, or fund development on Bitcoin. I, I think um, it's a recognition that for a lot of these companies, their business is built on top of this network, and the network is an open network supported by developers, open source developers, and the value of their company depends directly on that continuing to exist and continuing to be maintained and function cr properly and correctly and have bugs fixed and, and all of those things. So they recognize that if Bitcoin fails, then that will cause their company to fail or lose a lot of money. Um, so they are stepping up and funding developers. Of course, at the same time, it's not bad publicity for them that they are supporting this thing that all of their customers love and, and use. So it's a it's a nice marriage there between doing the right thing and um, good publicity. So yeah, I hope that will continue. There is some something of a tragedy of the commons that this is a public good and people can benefit from it without contributing to the open source process. Um, but you know, the trend is in the right direction. YouTube again. There we go. How does Bitcoin make sure that the right things are being funded, right? So, you know, not everything inside the protocol gets the attention it needs. Like, I don't know, like, is there incentive structure? Like how, how does the protocol itself kind of like alert uh, the issues and, and make sure that the right things are getting de uh, developed or built on? It doesn't. The, the protocol is is a protocol, it's uh, you know, a set of instructions and rules for how things interact. It has no will of its own and, and doesn't direct people to work on it. It's an open source project. Uh, well, okay, the, the protocol itself changes infrequently. The, the consensus protocol very rarely changes. The last change was 2017 with SegWit. The next one might be next year with Taproot if it gets activated, but we don't know. So there's, there's that side of things, which is pretty slow moving comparatively. Um, but then there's also the implementation, Bitcoin Core. And that is like any other software projects. It's always moving. There are always bug fixes, um, testing, refactors, new features, performance improvements, and so on and so on. Um, it's an open source project. And what people decide to focus their time and attention on is, is down to them because the project itself is not paying anyone. Um, people set their own priorities, just like any other open source contribution. And so I think this, this funding environment that we're in now, where it's quite distributed and there's funding coming from lots of different places, is very healthy because it means that you know, if you're interested in some feature or some aspect of Bitcoin that needs development, then you can fund that and there can be progress on that. And that's not preventing other people from funding other things. Um, so that's, that's basically how it works. Um, in your opinion, like when you look at the Bitcoin core project, like how do you kind of identify the places of need? Uh, I'm very interested in code quality and testing and security and resilience and, and making sure that we minimize the chance of 
catastrophic bugs. That's what I spend my time working on. And that means I spend my time reviewing code. I spend a lot of time on reviewing rather than writing code. And I spend quite a lot of my time thinking about the code quality and the architecture and the structure of the code base. So that's where I start and I get interested in, you know, I see a PR pop up, someone opens a PR and maybe that interests me. Um, but the, the kind of overarching consideration is code quality and is this moving the code in a safer, more secure direction? Is there like a wrong way to approach Bitcoin development? Again, like I'm, I'm thinking like there are a lot of organizations that are trying to get involved, right? Like, is there a wrong way to get involved? You know, you brought up the Bitcoin Foundation was a kind of a historic um, failure in that front. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about, you know, what you've seen and, and um, you know, maybe what's the right way? Yeah, I, I think that from what I can tell, the Bitcoin Foundation was started with the best of intentions. And there were some very good people there. Um, they, they funded some very good developments and some of the developers that they funded are still working on Bitcoin. So you can't really fault those intentions and, and those individuals who were developing under the Bitcoin Foundation umbrella. Um, there were structural problems with the organization and governance problems, and um, they probably overstretched and didn't have enough focus. But in terms of if an organization wants to fund Bitcoin development now, um, I'm not gonna say people are doing it in the wrong way. I, I can speak about struggles and difficulties that organizations have had. And those difficulties generally come from the fact that there's just an awful lot of context when you're thinking about contributing to the protocol. There's, you know, the, there's a protocol and the, the project itself, which are very complex things. There's lots of different aspects to them. There's cryptography and peer-to-peer -peer networks and consensus and getting your head around understanding like how all those things fit together and um, really understanding the protocol takes years of study, I would say. Uh, but then there's also the human you know, kind of social aspects of who's working on what and what's important to work on and how people work together. And so if you want to contribute to that process, you need to spend a lot of time, or well, if you want to contribute to that process and be effective, you need to spend a lot of time understanding both of those things, the, the technical aspects of the project and the social aspects of the project, um, because you can throw money at a developer, but if they're developing the wrong thing, then you know, maybe you feel good about it, but you're not really helping the project move forwards. Um, so the difficulty I think is really understanding that, con that context, understanding the ecosystem, you know, people's historical contributions, people's potential contributions in future priorities. And most organizations don't have someone who, who understands all of that, who, who knows all of that. And so either they need to outsource it to a board and they, they find an advisory board or task someone within the company to you know, very quickly try and onboard and, and, and work out what's going on in the ecosystem. And that's difficult, that's a, that's a big ask of anyone. Um, so I see that time and time again, people want to contribute, but they just, they don't have the context and they, they don't know how they can do it effectively. You're muted. Yeah, I keep doing this. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna not mute myself anymore. And that, that's kind of where Brink comes in, right? So obviously you wanna be kind of like that advisory board. Folks can come to you with their intentions and maybe you can guide the funds to where they need to go. Can you kind of talk about how Brink is going about um, the, the Bitcoin development process and how um, you all are, um, you know, kind of see the best way to get developers up to speed? Hmm. Well, yeah, there's, I mean, I, I'd say there's two main things that Brink can offer sponsors and funders. Um, one of them is the mentorship and the training piece. That's a, that's a focus of ours from day one. And that's the continuation of the work that I've been doing for years at Chaincode through the residency program, through PR Review Club and other efforts. And so I thought a lot over the years about how we onboard new developers into Bitcoin protocol work. It's, it, it's one of the biggest parts of my, of my work. The other thing that we can help with is, like you said, um, helping those sponsors make sure that they're 
funding is being used effectively. And the team and the board at Brink have combined years of experience working on the Bitcoin protocol. On, on the board, we have Dave Harding, who's been around since 2010. Um, I've been working on Bitcoin Core since 2016. So we know, you know, we know the protocol, we know who's been working on it. Um, I'm always on the lookout for talent and who's doing what, who has potential to do big contributions. And so we can advise and we can make sure that um, if a donor donates to Brink, that money will be used effectively and it will be used to make impactful contributions to the project. So speaking of looking out for talent, um, your first fellow is uh, a, a talented developer out of California, Gloria Zhao. Can you talk about mm -hmm. um, you know, how you found her, what that process was like? Um, is she going to, to London for your fellowship? Kind of like, tell us about Gloria. Gloria is amazing. She's, she's, um, she's got so much talent and so much potential and I am sure she's going to do amazing things in Bitcoin. Gloria was the president of the Blockchain of Berkeley, Berkeley Blockchain Club. Um, and my colleague, Adam Jonas, found her when he was looking for potential candidates for the residency program at Chainco. Um, she applied in 2019, she wasn't quite ready. And then in February, 2020, I went to a conference in, at Stanford. She was at that conference and Jonas set up a meeting between her, Amiti and me. And we talked about Bitcoin development and ended up talking for several hours about how cool Bitcoin was. And after that, Gloria and Amiti started um, having regular conversations. Amiti was mentoring her through her early Bitcoin core contributions. I started having calls with her you know, a couple of months after that and was also mentoring her. Um, and she's, you know, she's hungry for to, to make big contributions. She's very smart. And she was going to come to the the residency at Chaincode this summer that got canceled because of COVID. She ended up doing an internship at Google. Um, but started waking up at six in the morning or five in the morning so she could make contributions to Bitcoin Core before her internship started. Um, so I've been working her, with her for a few months and seen how, how quickly she's progressed in her contributions. And she was just an obvious candidate for the, the first fellow. So very, very excited. She will start with us in January. She'll be remote initially because travel is difficult. Um, but as soon as we can get her over here in London, We'll do that and she'll be working here. Amazing. Amazing. That's a, a really cool story. And I guess uh, inspired a question. Can you tell me a little bit about like the organic mentorship that happens within the Bitcoin developer community? Can you kind of like, obviously, you know, in Gloria's case, you know, people were looking for talent. Uh, developers took it upon themselves to kind of get her up to speed and then ready to ultimately um, be a good candidate for your formalized training. Um, can you just talk about, you know, that space and that community in general? Well, I can talk for myself. It's like I said, it's a big focus for me. Um, I'm, I don't know of anyone else doing similar things, but it's entirely possible they are. Um, I, I have regular phone conversations with several people um, who I'm mentoring. And I have regular conversations with people that I see as, as mentors and teachers. Um, and th th those are things that I've set up informally over the last few months. As soon as I started working remote, I started having these regular calls. Um, and it's, it's just part of, you know, it's part of what I see as, as my contribution to Bitcoin is trying to find people with talents and potential who just need a bit of guidance in, in their early contributions. And I give them a bit of guidance and, you know, really it's down to them to, to make the most of that and to contribute. But, um, you know, I, I think it helps tremendously when you're early on in your journey to have someone who's got a bit more experience to point you in the right direction. 
All right, cool. Well, I'm glad that you're doing it. And I'd be interested to uh, talk to more developers and kind of hear what their experience has been like. All right, this is my last question for you, John. Um, but this is something that I think some developers have mixed feelings on. Uh, you know, you are obviously looking to build Bitcoin. You're looking to make Bitcoin better. Obviously, you're very focused on code review and code quality. Um, but what? how do you feel about the idea of Bitcoin ossifying? And I know that you know, you can't have a very nuanced take to that. And I'm kind of curious what your nuanced take is to this idea of ossification of the code base. Yeah, I, th I think, again, um, it's quite important to distinguish between the protocol, the consensus protocol on, on, on one side and other aspects of the Bitcoin core project on the other. The protocol, like I said, changes very infrequently, very slow moving. That's what we want because that's what gives it stability um, and helps make sure we don't introduce bugs and problems with the protocol, but also gives people confidence that it's not going to change from underneath them. You know, money is important and you don't want your money to constantly be changing. So that pace of development on the protocol where we have changes only every few years is appropriate. On the other, on the other side, Bitcoin Core project is a software project and that keeps moving, that, that moves really quickly. There's PRs being merged every day, hundreds of PRs merged every year, you know, lots of activity. And that will continue because it's software and software is always living and you know there are always bugs to be fixed and performance to improve and testing to improve. So I, I think in that, that framework is quite important because sometimes people confuse the two and they think, well, Bitcoin's done, you know? We, we, we just want it to, to ossify and you know then we can fire all of the developers and and we're good we're done not quite the the protocol we do want to slow down the software project is very important for it to be a living project and for people to be working on it and understanding it in terms of the protocol i think you know maybe at some point it will ossify there's schnorr taproot is probably the next soft fork that's very important that unlocks a whole a whole load of new features and possibilities and there's so much that can be built on top of that so i'd like that to get in i, I don't want to ossify before that gets in looking forward to beyond that there are other potential improvements things like op ctv and um sig hash any prev out which would allow other cool applications it'll take a while for those to reach maturity through the kind of review process and get formally added and then you know maybe activated at some point i don't want to say there'll be a point where bitcoin the protocol is done because you know, people are ingenious and they're always coming up with better ways of doing things so i think it would be i, I don't think we can say at some point bitcoin's done and we'll never improve it again because science continues moving forwards so, i don't know yeah it's, no it's, uh, it's, it's for the future uh, absolutely, and I think that your your take was is is very very reasonable way to kind of like look at it. And I'm kind of curious in terms of what you've seen through the Taproot activation process. It's obviously been very different than the Segwit activation process. Like, what have you learned about Bitcoin governance and um, the future of implement you know adding new implement or new uh, you know changes to to Bitcoin's consensus? Um, I think every time we do it, we do it better. I think um, SegWit was better than the previous activation method methods or BIP9. And I think Taproot is, is better, again, just in terms of the activity that developers have done and people in the ecosystem have done. There's been a lot of consultation around um, the entire ecosystem, bringing people in and, and trying to spread knowledge and review across as wide a base of people as possible. Um, you know, what, one thing that we did at Optech was we, we created a workshop that people could download and run at home and learn about how to use Taproot. AJ Towns did a whole review cycle of um, the Taproot proposal. There've been a lot of PR review clubs about the Taproot implementation, lots of mailing list posts, lots of Optech newsletter articles, like all kinds of things to um, spread knowledge about how Schnorr and Taproot work. And 
bring along the entire community. So it's not just some developers in a in a room making changes. So that's really that's really healthy. I think that's what we want for an an open open source money system. Um, to be seen how activation goes, I expect it will go well and will not be contentious like Segwit was, but we don't know. Um, yeah, it's slow and it's deliberate. And I would say, I think we've done a pretty good job as, as developers and as a, an ecosystem at, at making it an open process and transparent. Yeah, you know, I love I love the take that we've done it better. Um, and obviously, we learned we've learned a lot. If you uh, go back, Aaron Van Wordham and Pete Rizzo recently uh, put out an article going into the history behind uh, P2SH. And mm -hmm. that was a very messy process, right? Um, so, yep. I, you know, obviously, you're a, a part of building out the making this process better after Segway, you you uh, and several others launched Bitcoin Optech to help exchanges kind of like you know, be a part of governance better and take a part in you know, treat the blockchain better and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, it makes a lot of sense why uh, you, your perspective is like, hey, we've actually improved the process and we're doing it better. We're coordinating better. So I really love that. Um, John, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, I really appreciate um, you giving me some of your valuable time. Uh, I want to give you your last word and an opportunity to uh, plug where people can learn more about you and Brink. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, so brink.dev is our website. That's brink.dev. Uh, pretty easy to remember. You can find Brink on Twitter at Bitcoin Brink. Um, and you'll find everything there. Oh, my, my username on Twitter is J-F Newberry, N-E-W-B-E-R-Y. So you can find me there. Awesome. Well, go check them out and uh, go check out Brink. I'm very excited to continue covering uh, the updates as they uh, they venture to bring uh, tax deductible Bitcoin core, um, you know, donation options. So I'm excited to participate when it does happen. And I hope you all do too. Uh, building on Bitcoin is, is something we got to do for uh, generations. Uh, but until then, all you Bitcoiners out there, please follow the show at Bitcoin Magazine. Follow me at CK underscore Snarks. Give the show five stars and share all that good stuff. Peace.